Good morning. For those of us that got rain, we're grateful. For those of you who didn't, you're jealous. Got a thunderstorm at my house. Raise this up just in case the other one dies. As you can tell, our text comes out of Acts chapter 9. Now, two weeks ago in Acts chapter 9, we were introducing to this strange cat by the name of Saul. Saul was a very interesting man, was he not? Saul was sent to Damascus with orders from the uh, chief priests in Jerusalem to round up all the Jews and all the Hellenistic Jews that had fled from Jerusalem into Damascus and to other parts of, 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 of Samaria uh, to, to haul them back because they believed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and proclaimed it. And so what you have is then Saul on the road to Damascus, and as he's there, all of a sudden, a light knocks him off his horse. Oh, not, not as, probably, you know, much brighter than any of these, and I'm sure Colton can get the intensity up, but probably nowhere near as bright as any of these. And Saul is blinded. And a man by the name of Ananias goes and introduces himself to brother Saul, and Saul receives his sight. And we're going to see here, Saul is going to begin his gospel ministry. And it's not going to be the exact same start as with Peter's. If you go back to when Peter begins, the Holy Spirit descends upon the twelve. And they're in the upper room. There's a sound of a rushing wind. And Peter goes out and he gets... And this is, if you're a minister, this is the kind of way you want to start your career. You get out, you preach one sermon... 3,000 people walk the aisle. You're a stud. We're going to watch Paul. And if you look at Paul and judge him based upon how humans judge success, he's a dud. And if he would just stop after the first three failed attempts, because the first three attempts are failed, you don't get Romans. You don't get first and second Corinthians. You don't get first and second Thessalonians, first and second Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. See, we don't measure success of a ministry based upon numerical response. We base it upon the response of God and what God does in the midst of great failure. And we'll look at this with Paul. Notice we start here. Notice uh, the phrase here says, it multiplied. This comes at the end. I'm giving you a hint to the verse at the end. It multiplied. And it multiplies in spite of what we would think would be successful. Notice what it says here. Immediately, he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue that he is the son of God. Now, to continue on with what is being proclaimed. This is what Peter proclaims. This is the message of the apostles. And notice they would always go, Jesus is the Son of God. He is resurrected from the dead. This Jesus whom you killed. That is not a popular message to your target audience. Your target audience is going, I'm loving some accusation that I murdered Jesus. Mm. Convict my soul. Convict my soul. Mm. No, usually what happens is, as we've seen up to this point, it has led to death to one deacon, it has led to the spreading and the exile of another, Philip, and it has also led to the arrest of two apostles and their beating and threatened further execution. Why? Because the preaching of Christ crucified is offensive to pagans. And any time you try to sweeten it with anything else, you've shifted it from the meaning of the gospel to something palatable culturally. And when you make it palatable culturally, what you end up with is nominal Christianity or cultural Christianity, and neither one of those are saved. Why? Because they will always look for culture to comfort them. Because their salvation isn't in the Christ of the crucifixion. They're in the Christ of whatever you added to it to make it palatable. Paul begins to preach 
to the people he was supposed to enlist and aid to find Christians to hunt and take back. And he begins looking at them and says, this Jesus who I came to, to arrest, all the people that believed in this name, he actually is the son of God. And he actually did raise from the dead. Well, notice the response of the folks in Damascus. And I imagine, you got to understand here, I mean, Paul has some credibility issues. He comes breathing threats of death and arrest to the church in Damascus. He's got some credibility issues. Self-inflicted. Right? When I get there, I'm killing you. And those I ain't killing, I'm hauling back. And now... He's proclaiming the word of God. Now, here's the interesting thing. Just a little side note. You know what scriptures Paul is proclaiming out of? Being at the time that Paul is speaking, there is no New Testament text written. Paul is speaking pre-40. He's talking, we're talking mid-30s, late-30s. The first New Testament text written, depends on who you go with, is either James or Galatians. And that's 40 to 45. So what scriptures is he using to preach from? The Old Testament. So when you have people today that say the Old Testament is of no value or we should divorce ourselves from the Old Testament, they aren't reading Acts. And they're certainly not reading the Apostles. And so he's proclaiming to these individuals out of Old Testament text that Christ is who he says he is and that he is been crucified and here's the thing this is what's going to get him in trouble with the Sadducees who are seeking his life that he raised from the dead this is why whenever I do a funeral I always focus upon the hope of the resurrection why because that is the lot of the believer it's not enough to simply go well I'm saved you're saved for what I'm saved for the resurrection to be reunited with the father and I have that hope because Christ has risen therefore I will rise the Sadducees hate that because they do not believe in the resurrection. All who heard were amazed, and they said, wait, wait, isn't this the same guy who wrecked shop in Jerusalem? And he did. Remember, at the stoning of Stephen, there he was giving approval to the death of Stephen. And then afterwards, went and arrested men and women and threw them into jail. Isn't that isn't that, that guy? See, he's got some credibility issues that overcomes. He's got a bunch that's going to that's gonna come along with, with other people that, and here in a minute. He is the man that wrecked havoc in Jerusalem upon what? Those who called upon this name. So the very name that he is claiming to proclaim, yes, I know, is the very God he was persecuting three to four days earlier. A lot of times, folks, we don't listen and we allow our past sins and our past mistakes to buffalo us in the proclamation of the gospel. Imagine, if you will, if Saul or Paul, whoever you want to call him at this point, was to be buffaloed by the fact that, oh, I can't. I can't. I can't proclaim the God's word. Do you know what I did? Do you know that I gave approval? Actually, it wasn't, it wasn't carrying out of a justice sentence, but I gave approval to murder a man for the very things I'm about ready to proclaim. You know, I, I can't. I can't preach. I came here with orders to murder these people. That's what the text calls it. Murder these people. For proclaiming the very thing I now am proclaiming. Imagine if you, Paul had given in to that thing that buffaloes us. You would have to have Romans, 1st and Corinthians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and Timothy. You wouldn't have Philemon. You wouldn't have Titus. You wouldn't have Galatians. You wouldn't have Ephesians. You wouldn't have Philippians. And you wouldn't have Titus. And if Athanasius is correct, you wouldn't have Hebrews if he had allowed himself to be buffaloed at that point. Imagine the impact you can have in your society if you stop allowing yourself to be buffaloed with your past sins. What are the sins that you're currently committed? 
See, because here's the thing is, while we look at that and go, well, Paul, Paul's different. You have a commission. When, when Jesus in Matthew 28, he doesn't go, some of you go. The others of you sit. Does he say that? Only the educated go. The laity sit. Does he say that? What does he say? Go. And the implied statement is whom? All. All. Well, you don't understand. Hmm? Doesn't work. Paul's a murderer. Paul murdered Christians. Paul, three to four days earlier, was there to kill the very people he's now preaching to. That wasn't an excuse for him. It's not an excuse for you. It's not an excuse for me. The devil loves to buffalo you. The devil loves to buffalo you with your past sins. Look, if I allowed him to buffalo me with my numerous and grand past sins, of which I will confess none of them to you. I should step out of the pulpit and go home and sit in a closet and perpetually beg for forgiveness. Because from a human standpoint, I'm unworthy. But from a godly standpoint, I have been made worthy. Not because of me. The same reason why Paul has been made worthy. Because it wasn't because of him. It was because of the crucified Lord of whom he now proclaims. See, we allow ourselves to be buffaloed, and we allow ourselves to, to let the devil use our passes to keep us quiet. This is the guy that was last week. He was trying to kill us all. I'm suspecting a plant. He's a mole. What we need to do is pull Paul aside and go, hey, you know what I'm going to tell you right now? Snitches get stitches. Just saying. He has... Has he not come here for the purpose of binding us and hauling us back to the chief priest? He is a man who has tried to destroy the church in Jerusalem. He is now here to take us back. You can't trust this cat. And he ought to not be trusted. Because four days earlier, he was here to kill us. All that happened was he lost his sight. Big stinking deal. I got a toenail that won't grow right. That's a big deal. See, if Paul had let any of these accusations get in the way, you don't have Romans. You don't have First and Second Corinthians. You don't have First and Second Thessalonians. You don't have First and Second Timothy. You don't have Galatians. You don't have Ephesians. You don't have Philippians. You don't have Colossians. And you don't have Titus. And if Athanasius is correct, you don't have Hebrews. Let's take a look. But Saul increased in more in strength and confidence and conf- or sorry, more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. Luke summarizes this better later on when he says Barnabas proclaimed how he preached. Think about the word that I'm going to use. Starts with a B. Has an O. Has an L. Thinking word I'm thinking of? Boldly. He proclaimed boldly with strength. Now here's how you do that. Let me ask you. Some people are natural corn-fed bubbas that can go into the gym, grab 300 pounds, sling it up, no problem. The rest of us mere mortals can proclaim all we want that we can sling up 300 pounds... But if I never go to the gym and work out, will I ever sling up 300 pounds? Hmm. If I never start my diet, of which I went off of a while ago, of which I now must go back on, will I ever lose weight? Hmm. If I had never asked Stephanie out... Would I have had those two beautiful girls over there? No. 
in order for me to increase in boldness to confound those to whom I share the gospel with, what must I do? I must share the gospel. Because I tell you, folks, the first couple of times in which you do so, you will step on yourself. I still can today. You can catch me flat-footed. And thank goodness salvation isn't tied to my presentation. Otherwise, there are a lot of unsaved people running around because I messed it up. And so will you. But Paul continued to preach. Paul continued to proclaim. And as he continued to proclaim, boldness continued. You can see this in the lives of young ministers. My first sermon was 45 minutes worth of content preached in 15 The comment was, it was like getting a drink of water from a fire hydrant. Oh, I preached every word, too. I just preached it at such a rapid rate, you can watch everybody in the room going like this. But over time, I got better. And over time, I've gotten better. And guess what? Over time, I will continually get better. Why? Because as you continue to do a thing, you get stronger in the thing in which you're doing. Teachers, the first time you teach a subject, are you an expert? By the 20th time you've taught it, if you have any sand, are you better? Will you continue to get better? When you proclaim the gospel, because our command is to go, the first few times it's not going to be a success in the eyes of yourself. That doesn't mean that you stop. Nor does that mean that you have a license to quit. Well, I tried it once. I tried it once and it just didn't, well, we just, gosh darn, I tried it and it just didn't work. Those are the excuses we use. Paul continues to do this. And we're going to see what happens here. We're going to see how successful Paul started. Now, I've already tipped my hand and told you it wasn't a success in the eyes of man. Notice what's saying. When many days passed, this is the next verse, the Jews plotted to kill him. Well, let's go back to Peter. Remember Acts. Peter gets out, proclaims the gospel, and what happens? 3,000 people walk the aisle. And he does it again and more. And at one point, there's 5,000 people in the church. And then some other things happened. He got arrested and he got beaten and all that stuff. But we always not focus on that. He preached 3,000. Paul preaches, and the Jews plot to kill him. Would you call that a success? Does it record number of people that got saved? No, for us, the fact that they planned to kill him. So when Paul preaches and Paul proclaims from the natural standpoint of mankind, well, he must not be as good as Peter. Well, here's the thing. How many books of the Bible does Peter write? How many books of the Bible does Paul write? Man, that's what I thought. The Jews... Plot to kill him. But Paul, or Saul, being aware of this plot, and know that they're watching, he goes out and preaches, and in spite of their attempt, thousands this time come and say, I want to be a follower of Christ. Is that what happens? Is that what happens when he proclaims? Paul is such a success, his first time go, that because of his success, they had to sneak him out of Damascus through a hole in the wall in a basket at night. In the eyes of man, is that a success? No. He's running in the cover of darkness to get away from those who are seeking to kill him, and there is no recording of any conversions. Well, he must not be able to bring it. You know, his problem was is he doesn't do an effective invitation. I'm sure Paul would have ended his sermon as Peter did. Every head bowed and every eye closed. 
John and James and Bartholomew are going to go over and sing a medley of just as I was. If you're here today and you crucified the Lord, I'd like for you to slip that hand up. Yes, I see that hand. Yes, I see that hand. Oh, I see that hand. If he'd have just followed that, he would have been a success. Imagine if Paul would have applied the principle that most churches apply. We tried that once. He tried this once. He's now running for his life, going out of a basket at night. Under the, we tried that once defense. What should Paul not do again? Try again. Paul's going to try three times. And then we tried that once the fence gets blown totally out of the water because he continues to try. Nowhere in the text does it say, once you've tried a thing, if it fails, you can't try it again. Matter of fact, that's a logical inconsistency. Because here's the thing is, did your, did your wife say yes the first time you asked her out on a date? I can tell you right now, Steph didn't want anything to do with me. She thought I was obnoxious and a jerk. And I was wondering how she figured that out on the first date. I stalked that poor girl. And then I made it known that I would stalk her to Tennessee. She finally gave up. How many times in your life have you really wanted something and really wanted to do something that you allowed your first time failure to stop you? Oh, but that's not the same. This is church. So when we're in church, it only counts. Is that right? Is that how it works? No. That's not how it works. His first sermon led to him being sought to be killed much in the same fashion as Stephen was. And in to avoid that happening, he flees under the cover of darkness through a hole in the wall being lowered in a basket. In the eyes of man, this cat's a failure. But then again, he writes Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. If an Athanasius is correct, he writes Hebrews. Right? And when he had come to Jerusalem, now he, here's his second chance. Now, here's the thing about Luke. And I'm going to take a drink and then I'm going to tell you. Luke is writing in chronology, but Luke is not covering all of chronology. When Paul leaves Damascus, in Acts, it looks like he is going straight to Jerusalem. However, there's a book in the Bible named Galatians that records that he doesn't go straight to Galatia, but he goes where? Into Arabia for three years. Why? Because if he doesn't, then what's said in Acts is either a lie or what's said in Galatians is either a lie. So he goes from there for three years to study with the Lord, and after three years, he now comes to see the disciples. You figure, after three years, the cats in Jerusalem would go, yeah, yeah. That Paul guy, he's been off the scene for a little while. Yeah, we need to bring him in. What do they do? Uh, we can't try. You might be a plant. And remember, snitches get stitches. And they were afraid for him to join them because they didn't believe that he was really a disciple. So the people in the, are supposed to be the head of the church in Jerusalem are looking at the next apostle going, nah. And so you know what Paul does? He goes back to making tents. No, that's not what he does. He quits being a minister. No, that's not what he does. He is met with an attempt to be successful to go and talk to the apostles, and their response is, No! It's not until Barnabas, a godly man, intercedes and restores the trust that Paul doesn't have with the apostles and says, look, this is the guy who on the road to Damascus has seen the Lord. 
And the Lord has spoke to him. And this is what he did in Damascus. He what? Say it loudly, folks. That's why it's bolded and underlined in italics. It's important. The command that we have out of Acts is when we proclaim the gospel, we are not to go... I'd like to tell you about Jesus if I could. No? Okay. We tried. I think I'll just do lifestyle evangelism. You know, I'm going to treat you really nice. And one day, you're going to recognize that I'm a good guy. And I just dorked up my iPad. That's called lifestyle evangelism. And lifestyle evangelism works because what you do is you set up the relationship. But here's the thing is, if you only focus on the relationship and never once broach the subject of the gospel, all you got's a friend. Some of us in here have allowed ourselves to be buffaloed with the concept that somehow we are loving by not sharing the gospel with family and friends and loved ones because we don't want to lose that friendship. Let me tell you, dear friend, you are not a loving friend. Let me restate this. You are not a loving friend or family member if you know the person you're talking to is going to hell and it doesn't bother you that that's where they're headed and you stay silent. Just like if you saw that same person drowning in a lake and you went, well, I'd intervene, but I won't get wet. Would that be an acceptable excuse? I intervene, I'd intervene, but I don't want to, I don't want to offend him by me dragging him in. This is a loving friendship. Please tell me, please, uh, help me, help me understand how it is a loving friend or family member that willingly allows a loved one to go to hell because they have said nothing about the eternal state of their soul and then claim that you're loving. Well, uh, help me with that. Well, see, what happens is we allow ourselves to get buffaloed with this concept of, well, I don't want to lose a friend. Temporally. But by staying silent, guess what you do? You lose them eternally. And you have those things mixed up. Let me tell you. Paul is not trusted in Jerusalem. Paul, here in Jerusalem, is going to be sought after again to be murdered. Paul, in Damascus, is threatened to be killed. And they were going to kill him. Yet, he hasn't stopped proclaiming the gospel. You live in a time where no one's kicking in them back doors and hauling us off to jail. No one, when you proclaim the gospel to them, is going to go, Magistrate, this is a Christian. And you're hauled off and lose everything. See, cultural Christianity gets its comfort from its things. True Christianity, as we will see, gets its comfort from the Holy Spirit and its direction from a holy God. We are all very comfortable. It's very easy to do. Look, I live in a Christian bubble. Every member of my family that is alive is a believer. 99% of my friends are believers. And the ones that aren't get tired of me talking to them about Jesus. All of you, if you're in here, I'm assuming, unless you tell me otherwise, you're a... So I now have to find people but are not believers on a daily basis. I have to move outside of my Christian bubble. Some of you don't have that conundrum. All of you have a one. And Paul is proclaiming, and notice what he does. He proclaims boldly the name of Jesus. Remember, is this the first time this command is ever given in the book of Acts? 
No, the disciples pray for boldness after being beaten. What's our excuse? What's our excuse? Well, no one asked me. Now, you notice that Paul isn't waiting for someone to ask him. Notice what happens. So he went out, because the disciples won't meet with him, and, and among and the people just, and preached what? Mentions it again, boldly, to the people of Jerusalem. And you know what happened this time? Thousands, because this is Jerusalem. Thousands come forward. But he broke Peter's model. Because he got that invitation down. Not only did he have every head bowed and every eye closed, he started off with, if you're here today and you love Jesus, raise your hand. If you're here today and you haven't been following Jesus, I want you to raise your hand. And he worked that emotional blackmail. And man, he had Barnabas over on the keyboard playing just as I was, just so soft and melodiously. And he was really working. No. That's not what happens. Notice what happens. He spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, the same people that murdered Stephen, the same people that he was sent with to go and capture the disciples, the same people that are having a problem with the gospel because they are stirred up by the Sadducees who do not believe in the resurrection. And guess what the Hellenists decided to do? They decided they were going to kill him. Have you ever noticed... Have you ever noticed that in Acts, typically, when the Word of God is preached, the response is not, well, let me find out more about this Jesus who you're proclaiming about. Typically, the response is, got to kill that guy. And this is an apostle. And he is not buffaloed. By death threats. And he's not buffaloed by threats against his physical safety. As, as a matter of fact, we will get to a point in the text where Paul is stoned like Stephen is. And left for dead. And you know what he does? Besides that, he gets up and goes back into the city that stoned him. And proclaims the gospel. What's your excuse? What's your excuse? Compared to that, does your excuse measure up? Compared to this scenario, does the justification we use mean anything? So here's the question. Are we being obedient to the command of the Father? Or are we being rebellious? Are we being comfort Christians? Or Christ-centered Christians? Paul, now twice, has been confronted with death. Paul, now twice, has had people seeking to murder him the same way Stephen. And Paul is not ignorant to what this death looks like. Paul was there when they did it to Stephen. He knows the pain. If you've never seen a stoning, folks, it's not pretty. And they do it in the places where, where I and Larry have served. And typically they do it to women. And it's not a pretty sight. It's a very violent and painful death. And we're worried about a little rejection? If you were worried about a little rejection, would you have asked your wife to marry you? Or would you have agreed to marry your husband? Well, no, none of us in this room would be married if we were worried about... If we were so worried about rejection, there wouldn't be any little kids in this room. There'd be a ton of single people. See, when we boil it down to that, any excuse we proffer, any excuse, and myself included, fail miserably. And there are days where I know I probably should talk to somebody about, and I fail miserably. 
And I got it. But that doesn't excuse me from the requirement to go. And while I go comfortable, and at times have grown comfortable, <clears throat> in the lack of proclaiming my faith, that doesn't excuse me because Saul is having people seeking to kill him. If they catch him, they kill him. I don't have that issue here. I don't have that problem here. And so since that's not an issue, I grow comfortable. And since in comfort, then when you get comfortable with things, guess what you choose not to do? But when the brothers, not Saul, when the brothers found out, they sent him to Caesarea and then off to Tarsus. They got him out of the city. The first three attempts of Saul's ministry, if you're looking at it from human aspect, are abject failures. In every case, he's either untrusted by the disciples whom he's trying to link up with, or people are trying to kill him in both cases. And in both cases, people are seeking his life. From a very humanistic and worldly standpoint, Peter's the bomb, this guy's a dud. But I want you to know what Acts records. The church throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace. Wait, what? People are seeking to murder Christians and they had peace? Yes. Wait, what? People are seeking to arrest you and murder you. And if you're caught, you're stoned. And if the government officials catch you, you go to jail. And in the time, in, in a couple of years from now, within the first century, they will feed you to a lion. Or use you to bloody the gladiator's blade. And they had peace? Yes. Because their peace isn't wrapped up in the comfort of their surroundings. Their peace is wrapped up in the hope of the resurrection. Where they don't fear death because to be parted here is to be where? And see what happens is we fear the lack of comfort now. It's because we've embraced cultural Christianity. Not true Christianity. And they were being built up. How were they being built up? Here's the sermon, ready? It wasn't a feel-good sermon. Here's the thing, folks. G.A. Chesterton and, uh, makes a brilliant point on this. Christianity is not tried and found wanting. means it's not tried and been found lacking in anything. It's been tried and found difficult. That's why people quit it. C.S. Lewis once said, I didn't come to Christianity to feel comfortable. I always knew a good bottle of port would let me do that. I came to Christianity to be convicted. How is the church built up? This is the sermon. Jesus Christ has come and you murdered him. But he has risen from the dead and there's forgiveness of sin. That's the sermon. And the church continued to be built up. Now notice these two odd statements. They walked in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Wait, aren't those mutually exclusive statements? That's how we look at it. We approach these two statements as mutually exclusive, and yet Acts does not. They bind them together. And actually, for the believer, they should be bound together. Why? Because, and, and here's the thing. We pervert the understanding of what it means to fear the Lord. We go, well, what it means is reverential respect. In the Old Testament... Every time the Lord, or the angel of the Lord, which is uh, the Lord himself, shows up to an individual, you never say, let's just take Manoah out of Judges, Samson's father. The Lord shows up and Manoah goes, I reverentially respect you, almighty God. Thank you for appearing to me. Is that what he says? Oh, we're dead! We've seen God! It's over, babe. We ain't had a kid yet. What's Gideon's response? Thank you for showing up. I reverentially respect you. Mm, you're such a reverent God. No. Oh, I'm dead. Every account in the Old Testament where the second person of the triune God shows up, the human person there goes, I'm a dead man. 
So the concept of reverential respect was to make this seem palatable to us. We are to be afraid of who God is because he is the holy creator of the universe. And when we stand before him, we should tremble at the fact that we are rancid things. And with a thought, with less than a thought, can obliterate us. But because he is a holy and just and loving God, he dies for you. And therefore, you are filled with the comforter of the Holy Spirit and are comforted with the power that you now are sons of the King. And that you now can call him Abba Father. And so you have two sides of that coin. And if you lived your life as a believer, living with the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, you will talk to believers differently. You will talk to the world differently. And you will not be afraid of the threats of the world because the world can do nothing to you that God will not allow. Even if it means they take your life. And you should be more afraid of him than any other person on the earth. And because he's your maker and he's also your savior. And you are comforted by the work of the Holy Spirit within you to where you have the confidence assurance that when you open your mouth that the Holy Spirit will aid you in your defense if you are resting and trusting upon him and reading your text on a daily basis. And you know what happened to the church? You know what happened to the church that had three, two failed sermons and a failed attempt to link up with the apostles? You know what happened to that church? It multiplied. It multiplied. See, because success isn't always determined by numbers. And success isn't always determined by eloquence of speech. And success isn't always determined by how we perceive success. Success in the eyes of God is determined by what the movement of God is amongst the people. And the church grew. The sermon, Sinners in the Hand of Angry God, is written by Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards is not an eloquent speaker. Matter of fact, Edwards is known to have done this as he read Sinners of the Hand of Angry God. And he just reads it. And history records he reads it in a very monotone way. That sermon is responsible for what is known as the first great awakening in the United States of America. Whitfield and Wesley are also wrapped up in that, but Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God is a very vital sermon in that. And it was read in a monotone way. Probably a way that would put many of you to sleep. And yet it terrified an entire generation because it describes the soul being held over the pit of hell by nothing more than a strand and a loving God that saves them from that or a loving God that sends them to it. Some of you cannot even be bothered to attend regularly. And you wonder why the church doesn't multiply. And I'm not talking just this church. I'm talking about the church in America. It's in, it's in drastic decline. Because the emphasis of the people within the building are not on outreach from the building. The emphasis of the people in the building, data shows, is on the people in the building. The church in America is inward focused. Focused on placating those who attend. The church in Acts is outward focused. Focused on proclaiming the mission and the gospel out. Focused on taking it into the othermost parts of the earth. Focused on proclaiming in spite of death threats and death. That was their focus. The Church of America today is focused on the obtaining of programs and the obtaining of self. And we wonder why we don't multiply. Well, I'm going to help you out. 
Your millennial generation and your Z generation, when they see a church that is focused inwardly, will not tolerate that. They will look for a church that has an outward focus. They will not attend. You have told them, you have told them, this is what you've told them whether you realize it or not. You have told them, we're a country club, not a church. And you know what will happen to your church? It will not multiply. Which is why the Southern Baptist Convention is on a steady and rapid decline. Which is why every mainline denomination is on a steady and rapid decline. Now there are two reasons for this idea. One, that the church is truing and norming. And that true Christians are going to be the ones that are retained left. And everyone else is falling away. The nominal or the cultural Christianities. And I think that is part of it. And the other aspect is because we are refusing to reach out to a generation, actually two, because they believe weird things, and they believe they're experts in everything. I watched a video this morning of singing a song about millennials, and I was laughing all the way through it. But the truth of the song is, if you're mocking them, they will not attend your church. And if you're not reaching out to them, they will not attend your church. And if you are inward focused, they will not attend your church. And if you're still fighting over whether or not we should be traditional or contemporary or blended, they will not attend your church. They are done with all these little petty wars that are internal. They want to see a church that's outwardly focused, like the church facts. Generation Z might be considered one of the most receptive generations to the gospel. The data is still out on that. But you know what happens? We're not focused on Generation Z. You know why? Because we're not focused on their parents. Because you know where our focus is? As a church universal in the United States? On ourselves. As long as we live with the belief that these buildings exist to make us feel good, we will be a church that will not multiply. And you know why? Because the focus isn't on the expanse of the gospel. The focus is on the comfort of our seat. You have a commission, every single one of you in this room, to include myself. And that commission is to go. If you are not going, you are rebellious. If you are rebellious, this will not happen. The logic is sound. And the logic is simple. No one is threatening you with death. No one is threatening me with death. No one is going to haul my wife and children off to the prison cell for my proclaiming the gospel. So why do I allow myself to be buffaloed with the excuses of it's not the right time? I don't want to upset the family dinner. Or any other issue that might come to mind. Why do you allow that? What excuse can you proffer? that trumps what Paul has gone through? What excuse can you offer that trumps what Christ gone through? We are either a going church or we will not be a growing church. Do you understand how the correlation works? You're here today as the praise band comes. You have been like me, a rebellious steward of God's blessing who at times has refused to follow the very plan that Christ has and the commission that he has given us, which is to go. Today, today, I'm not asking you to come forward, I'm not asking you to come and make a public profession, but I am asking you where you're at in the pew, first, that you repent. And secondly, that you become a going Christian. Otherwise, we will not be a growing church.